Good morning. February will be a busy month for us. Um, February 1st is the thrift store work day. February 2nd, lunch bunch at 1 p.m. at Cracker Barrel on some Center Road. Sign up sheet in Narthex. Please put your name on the list if you plan to attend. Uh, February 4th is thrift store sale day. February 5th, Scout Sunday and Birthday Cake Sunday and Fellowship Hall following service. February 12th, Finance Meeting and Conference Room. February 19th, Session Meeting and Conference Room. February 26th, Annual Congregational Meeting. Uh, just so you're aware, there are vegetables uh, on the counter in the back if anybody would like to take any. Are there any other announcements? Then let us be a worship. Though we have known problems, 
God will see us through. Though we have been down, God will lift us up. Though we have been surrounded with doubts, God will restore our faith. This is a new day. About one another. To be made whole. To sing and praise God. Please join us in hymn number eight, Come Thou Almighty King.
say, the most important people are here. So consider yourself special. Now these I have in my hand. I'm sure you recognize what, what these little yellow things are. These are post-it notes. Uh, very, very sophisticated little gizmos. I mean, basically you could stick them on anything. And then you can pull it back off and it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, before 1980, these things didn't exist. Nowadays, if you work in an office, you can't live without them. They go through thousands of these things. They also have little post-it bookmarks. Now they're making per outside post-its. So you can post something outside and it'll hold up to the weather. You figure, wow, what a tremendous marketing and sales idea. Well, that isn't exactly how it happened. Spencer Silver, a chemist for uh, 3M, was attempting to develop a stronger adhesive than the company had had up to that point. He said, it was part of my job as a researcher to develop new adhesives, and at that time, we wanted to be develop bigger, stronger, and tougher adhesives. This thing on the post-it note was none of those. What he came up with was something called microspheres, which retained their stickiness and had a removability characteristic that they hadn't seen before, allowing them to be attached to any surface like this, and then pull it off, and it didn't do any damage. 3M didn't know what to do with it. For years, uh, Spencer Silver struggled to find a use for his invention, preaching the merits of his creation, and he got the nickname Mr. Persistent, but again, 3M couldn't figure out what you do with something like this. Then in 1974, he was approached by a 3M colleague, Art Fry, who had him talk about this particular thing. And it turns out, Art Fry was a member of his church, and he sat right there in the choir hall. And he had gotten this crazy notion that if nothing else, you got these things laying around, I'll take them to choir practice. I'll put them as bookmarks on my music. That way I'll be able to turn. And he says, every other thing I try, no matter, every time I get up to open my music, it fall out. So he shows up with these things. And the other choir member said, that's a genius. Can you have some for us? So pretty soon they brought some for the choir, and pretty soon the people in the congregation said, that's ingenious. Do you have any for us too? He said, I thought what I needed was a bookmark that would stick to the paper without falling off and not damage the sheets. And then it grew from there. Then it turns out the team that developed it saw what the church was doing with it, and decided to use it for themselves. You know, posting notes on people's desks and stuff. The point of the matter is, this successful little gizmo that makes a lot of money was in essence a mistake. That was not what he was attempting to invent. But, because somebody had the good sense to know what to do with it, it became one of the largest sellers 3M has. Now, when you stop and think, uh, everybody says, well, you know, God doesn't make mistakes. And that's true. But you know what? Sometimes it takes a little while for, for God to be proven right. And that it is, that is the way with our faith. Stop and think. Peter, didn't, Peter wanted to be a businessman. He wanted to fish for a living. Then this guy Jesus comes along and puts him in an entirely new line of work. And very successfully. 
Paul, on the other hand, wanted to persecute the church. Then this guy Jesus comes along, and next thing you know, he's the most ardent supporter and probably did more to start the church movement than anyone else of his time. So you see, sometimes we try to think that we know what to do, but God will intervene and say, here's what I think you should do. And hopefully when that happens, we're ready to listen. Praise be to God. Amen. The New Testament lesson is Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. It can be found on pages 10, 10, and 1011 of the Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. This is from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and what we call the Beatitudes. Here the Word of God is recorded by Matthew. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. 
His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, or falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they were persecuted the prophets who came before you. May God bless the reading of his word on this special day. In the early 60s, there was a couple of movies made by Fred McMurray. You all remember Fred McMurray, right? My Three Sons, The Father Who Knew Everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, they, was, uh, they were called, the first one was called The Absent-Minded Professor. Remember that one? And then the second one was called Son of Blubber, because basically the first one, remember he invented this particular, I don't know what it was, some sort of a, 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 a paste or something, that if you put it on a person's shoes, they could jump as high as the ceiling. I've been trying to buy that so that we could put it on some people's shoes and maybe use it to change the lights in here. But uh, anyway, the second movie was about something else he was developing. And uh, it was some sort of array that was designed to make certain things happen. Well, one of its side effects was it broke windows in the aim in which it was set. And naturally, the villain played by Keenan Wynn owns the insurance company that has to pay off on all those broken windows. And they have a trial going on. And, you know, the professor's on the stand. And the uh, plaintiff's attorney asks that the professor is encouraging his students to make mistakes, even if one of these mistakes could turn out bad. The professor answered with this line. Every man who falls flat on his face at least was going in the right direction at the time. Now, there is a reason for this. Some churches have a hard time dealing with new things and the changing world. Some try things, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. There's a tendency for outsiders to say, See, I told you that wasn't going to work. However, we forget that moving in the right direction is always a good thing. We may not get very far, but at least we're going in the right direction at the time. Former President Theodore Roosevelt stated this well in a landmark speech that included the following quote. Again, these are the President's words. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who in the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who will never either know victory or defeat. Christians are expected to be doers, you know. Jesus was the ultimate doer. Paul, Peter, and John were doers. 
Paul was a doer. Many who came before you in this church were doers, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So what exactly does God expect from a Christian doer? We heard from Micah chapter 6, verse 8, that was read by Renee earlier. Listen to how the message interpretation says those words. But God has made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It is quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And do not take yourself seriously. Too seriously, I guess. Instead, take God seriously. Jesus emphasized these same points during the Sermon on the Mount that we read this morning. Remember it said that Jesus sat down, and in those days, when, it, when, it, when, it, when some, a great teacher would preach, they would sit down, and that was the signal. Recall Jesus said that the blessed people were not the ones we would expect, but they included the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. However, Jesus ends the sermon by stating that those who will follow and stand up for him will be empowered to face whatever odds befall them and will be rewarded in eternal life. Here is how the message translates these words. Count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you that discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they're uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even, for even though they do not like it, I, being Jesus, do. All and all heaven applauds, and you know that you're in great company. My prophets and witnesses have all been prosecuted or persecuted in the same exact way. In short, Jesus used the Sermon on the Mount to explain that everyone has value, all of us. And anyone can be a doer, despite the resistance from outsiders. Now, Annie went to the, uh, the meeting with the presbyter. Did, you, did they do the part on the self-development of people? And the self-development of people is, is a real cool thing. It's part of the uh, One Great Hour of Sharing. And what happens is we offer grants to startups that are based on meeting human needs. And you heard about a bunch of them. I recall some of the past ones. There were things like, uh, for example, there was a recycling uh, business that started up on the west side. A local community, there are several local community gardens that got started because of that. Uh, there was also somebody who did safety training for free so that people could get into the construction trades. And there was a cupcake bakery in Cleveland Heights that we, we, we took care of some years ago that would put, you know, great sayings on top of the cupcakes that they would sell. Now, to be sure, some of these efforts might have failed after a while. However, the concept of giving a fishing pole and training people how to use it helps build doers and remains a sound strategy. However, the better stories about doers came from the individual churches. I've mentioned Isaac Mona before. He's a native of Liberia. He convinced his church and others of the presbytery to help him establish the Dugby River School in the middle of the jungle near where he grew up. The school started from nothing in 2012 and today serves 12 villages by offering a co-ed education, which is rare in Liberia, a community center, living quarters for the teachers and students, a cooperative farm, and some health care facilities. It started from nothing 10 years ago. Just one man's dream. And there were a few stumbling blocks along the way, but look at where it ended up. Another example is the Tony Flato Christian Academy in Esteli, Nicaragua. Tony was a good Christian friend of mine. And he was walking in the metro parks, in, you know, just outside of North Homestead, 
And believe it or not, a tree fell and killed him. But his work and his foundation went on. The people from John Knox and other churches have made several trips to Nicaragua and helped build the first building for his academy. Today, the Tony Flato Christian Academy Foundation supports a functioning school, and you can check their successes on Facebook. This is what doers can accomplish. Imagine if someone walked right up here after me and said, guess what? I want to start a school in El Salvador. All I need you to do is come up with a way to pay for it. What would you say? And if you were the one that was doing the effort to try and set it up, if enough people told you no, would you abandon the effort or keep going? Churches in our presbytery have had successes because they would not take no for an answer. That's just what a small sampling of what doers can do. Now, we all know that this church, like every other one, is, is under severe financial pressure. Membership may not be growing, but costs are rising, especially this year. Unfortunately, many churches with financial troubles, you know how they manage it, of course, they cut out the outreach part. However, there are churches that, pack, that press ahead regardless of the financial situation. Uh, how many of you have read The Purpose Driven Church and The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren? Okay. The success of that ministry led the media to try and figure out what magic pill he's got working for him. Here's what the media found out. In August 2006, Fox News featured a television special entitled, Can Rick Warren Change the World? Throughout the show, reporters interviewed Rick about his best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life, and his ministry at Saddleback Church. By the way, he's retired now. And his leadership in the church growth movement nationwide. They also spotlighted his attempts to move beyond the boundaries of this country with a global network of churches to revolutionize the way we tackle what Rick believes are the five biggest problems facing the world today. Here they are. Poverty, disease, illiteracy, spiritual emptiness, and egocentric leadership. Isn't that one interesting? As the interview progressed, the nagging questions seemed to taint the ambition, pastors' hopes, and plans. Can it really work? Can one person, or one church, or one network, or one nation really heal all the hurts in the world? Rick Warren did not shy away from that answer those questions. At the end of the interview, he said, I hope there will be four words on my tombstone. At least he tried. Now, Saddleback Church has done more than try. They've established something called PEACE, -E, or Peace Program, which stands for Plant Churches That Promote Reconciliation, Equip Servant Leaders, Assist the Poor, Care for the Sick, and Educate the Next Generation. Today, Saddleback Church speaks of this effort and how it begins in the local church like this one with this quote. They say, if you're truly committed to the task of reaching the nations, the local church must be the central point in every step of this process. The local church around the world represents a legion of world changers. That's you folks. A legion of world changers waiting to be equipped and trained for the task of reaching what he calls unengaged, unreached people groups. It is entirely sustainable. The only thing on earth that will last forever is churches and people sitting in them. It has the widest distribution, the biggest tra trans uh, participation, and the strongest motivation for doing all of this. Why do we do all this stuff? One word, 
love. This church, like every other local church, must determine its commitment to building the kingdom of God here on earth. How well is this ministry equipping servant leaders? We're going to have to do that this year. How strong is our commitment to assisting the poor and caring for the sick? I think we're pretty, we're pretty well along the way on that one. Let's just keep going. Is the ministry working to educate this and the next generation as we know? Well, for the last two weeks, the next generation was here, and we, start, we started to think about how we would do that. After all, we know the church is the only institution on this planet that trains and supports Christ-centered doers. That's what we're in business for. This ministry will continue to grow and thrive if we attract seekers and lead them on their personal faith journeys and offer opportunities for them to grow through participating in worship and at some point having them join us in service. That is, we have to make a commitment to the peace effort, even in a small way. As we enter 2023, we're almost, we're almost one, we're month, one into it already. Lent's on the horizon. Now, we're going to be challenged to determine what this ministry will look like and find the ways to support that vision. This church has been and will always be a church of doers. No one will ever take that away from you. In the past year, you have tried new things. I don't know if you noticed. We had a live Bible study. We added the lunch punch and also meals for the homeless. Some of these things work okay. Some of these things, not so much. The success stories also included balancing the budget. Do you know we did that? And the success of the thrift store, but we still have work to do with respect to maintaining our Sunday morning worship attendance and attracting new members. That's going to be a challenge going forward. In each case, church members were moving forward at the time. And you're continuing to move. This ministry has been, has been looking to put its name out there, and we're finding the creative ways to do it. This ministry has two choices this year. It can either stay where it is, be safe, and hope it works out. On the other hand, it could move forward and in new directions, whether they succeed or not. Remember, this or any ministry takes steps to move forward. Whether those steps work out or not, they are going in the right direction at the time. I remember a church one time that started it and asked everybody to get in a line right, right through here. And then they said, all right, if the person stands at the end, stand there. Everybody else, take two steps forward. So there's spaces now between them. And you know what happens? The last person is out the door. That is what doers can do. Let this ministry continue to prove to the world that we are and will always be doers. Praise be to God.
part of what you do. And now, my friends, it's that time of year when we have to talk about sustainability. Uh, Thelma has been handing out last year's statements. And if you have pictures up yet, uh, please see her. Uh, there's only a few boxes of envelopes that haven't been claimed, so if you haven't claimed yours yet, I'm sure we can take care of that. Uh, so th those are the kinds of things that every church has to do. But it's not so much the mechanics that matter. It's what happens when people respond. The work we do. We have a thrift store coming up. And the thrift store is as much a fellowship as it is a store effort. I mean, let's stop and think. Everybody has a job. Everybody interacts. We know some of the people who come in. It's like they, they're our friends. It's a, good, it's a good time. And that's what happens most of the time. When we work with, with, in ways that God wants us to, to help people, we usually end up getting more out of it than they do. So let us you know, think about that as we are willing to share our time, talent, and treasury in this year of 2023. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship in this special place. We thank you for granting us the ministry that you have on this corner so that we may use it to further your kingdom here on earth. Help us to work together. Help us to support each other. But more importantly, help us to reach out to those you would send to us. For that is the only way the good news is spread, and that is the only way your kingdom can grow. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.
spell for that, I'd use it, but I don't think we do. Uh, how's your sister? She's doing about the same, but she did have a couple of good days, so that's a good thing. Fantastic. Uh, Karen is still in Parma, right? So she's still she's still not wants to go home though, right? She still wants to go home. Yeah, she's, she's not going to. So uh, again, is she, is she still answering your phone? Uh, usually, yeah. You know, so if anybody wants to call, you know, feel free to. Or text. Yeah. You know? She doesn't know the number. Sometimes she won't. <laughs> All right. We hear that uh, Lenny is going. The mompus is going to be at the VA doctor. In a few weeks. And if you notice that there's anybody not hasn't been here for a while and you know them, uh, do the church a favor. Give them a call and find out if there's anything we need to know about. Uh, it's the only way we can keep track. Because uh, sometimes, sometimes, you know, people expect that through, somehow through osmosis we'll figure it out. And that doesn't work very well for me. Uh, I didn't see you walking with anything. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, so how's the, the ankle fully healed? Not yet. Not yet. About 80%. Oh, good. For somebody else to be on their feet all day, that's a little yeah. tricky. You went back to the same job? Yeah. So they don't have you behind the desk or anything. That's even better. Are there any other uh, you know, joy, joys or concerns for today? If not, let us share our prayer for this Sunday morning. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all things large and small, we thank you for your love and caring that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for your son Jesus who taught us that who is truly blessed in the kingdom of God may not be who we think it is. But more importantly, he taught us how to make the blessings we do have work with all that we encounter. Help us to find ways to make peace on earth real in our time. Again, the conflict in Ukraine continues to rage and it seems to be even escalating. We ask again that you show us ways to end the use of arms to resolve the disputes that started this war and to implement more peaceful solutions. Watch over our service people in the field and help them do what they can to establish and maintain the peace that you would have. Guide and support the chaplains, medical personnel, and other volunteers who are supporting our service people wherever they may be deployed. Close to home, Lord, we ask for your help to curtail or stop the senseless violence that has been seen recently throughout our country. Help each of us to pay attention and to take appropriate action should that become necessary. Lord, several of your children are experiencing periods of pain or distress or have simply lost their way. We thank you for Cynthia's continued recovery from that broken ankle. Today we pray for Karen who remains in assisted living and and with a therapist. We pray for Kenny as he continues to undergo dialysis treatments and for Kelly's co-worker Brian who is still in the hospital. We pray for Lois who has returned home but remains under a doctor's care as well as Lisa and Sue who have cancer and we heard the update today. We pray for Renee, who has had her first treatment and, continued, and continues to do well with it. We continue to pray for Lenny, Eileen, Jenny, Eric, Linda, George, and Pauline. Lord, you have known these people since before they were born. You know their situations at this very moment. We ask that you provide the guidance and healing that you know that they will need. We also ask for your healing and your sympathetic hand for those names that we know of that we did not speak out loud today. 
Inspire us to reach out for those who call us to help. Help us to remember that we are to be your ambassadors of hope and love, not only for the people that we know, but for anyone you would lead us to. Lord God, we pray for this church and its ministry. Help us to discern the future of this ministry and help us to use the resources you have provided to continue to make this ministry sustainable and carry the good news forward in the coming days. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 